we are taking basically the mailman's um, their approach to uh, broadcasting and college football news and uh, discussion, debate, and analysis here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Rain, sleet, snow, plague, famine, whatever it takes. Uh, we're here talking Ohio State football once a week. And of course, we remind you each and every week that because of the schedule conflicts involving myself and our uh, three illustrious um, guests, that uh, you got to stay in tune with the subscription, the notifications, uh, click the bell, and you get the notifications of when we appear. Presto, here we are, Friday at noon Eastern time uh, for this particular week. Uh, top to bottom, we got Kevin Noon from Rivals Buckeye Grove. Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts on 247 Sports and Tony Gerdeman from the Ozona.net. So always have to um, these days premise the greeting with under the circumstances or considering the situation, how is everyone doing? <laughs> A little stir crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, actually nuts. Uh, I mean, we've been in Ohio. Uh, you know, they closed all the bars and restaurants and uh, now all the barber shops and everything else. And uh, so you're kind of stuck at home with not a whole heck of a lot to do. And then in the last probably 48 hours, we've gotten about three or four inches of rain as well. So now we've gone from quarantine to floods and the locust must not be too far behind because uh, – that's kind of where we're at right now. In fact, my street is uh, flooded down by, uh, we have a bridge to get into our development and uh, it's kind of hard to get down to the bridge right now. So yeah, there's not a whole heck of a lot going on over here. Well, I'm a shut in pretty much. So nothing has really changed for me. We like it that way. Yeah. I'm a homebody. So yeah, I got to tell you with the weather condition being what it's been for the last couple of days prior to that, it was beautiful at least up here in Connecticut, so I could at least, uh, you know, go for a walk, go for a stroll, do a few other things, but uh, not any incentive to get out there right now. Uh, been working from home for a couple of days, but for the next three, it will be uh, heading on into work and uh, all sorts of conditions in place, as you could imagine, to keep people spaced out and in their own um, confines as much as possible. So uh, we will dive into it. And of course, for anybody on the line, of course, we're going to take your comments and questions uh, straight to Tony, Steve, and Kevin. Well, for what it's been in regards to the limitations on recruiting that are obvious, no in-person visits, uh, that's been in play for maybe about two to three weeks, something in that range. Uh, Ryan Day and staff are certainly making the best of it. Uh, whatever they, Whatever magic they have over the phone, over texting, over FaceTime, whatever use they're putting to it, Kevin, uh, or, or I'll start with Steve, uh, since I told Steve before we started to record that we would start with him. Don't want to change up the lineup. So Steve, in regards to uh, your thoughts about Ohio State recruiting, uh, the list is becoming mighty impressive. I saw one today that actually was comparing Ohio State. And again, we are way out from what is going to be signed, sealed, and delivered in December and February, but comparing Ohio State to entire conferences, including the SEC. It's, it's impressive. Yeah, it's it's crazy right now what Ohio State has already done in terms of early recruiting for 2021. None of these players can sign with Ohio State until December, roughly nine months from now. And uh, yet uh, the Buckeyes have uh, already got nine of the top 100 uh, in the 24-7 sports composite locked up and probably in a good position to land maybe three or four more depending on how it all goes so they are in very good position uh they just received uh i believe it was three more verbal commitments this past week maybe i don't know i lose track four, four in a four in almost a three-day period i think it was uh jacqueline johnson a cornerback out of st louis he's the number 59 prospect in the country then this was a big one right here, running back Evan Pryor of North Carolina, ranked number 85 nationally, and Ohio State uh, certainly in a position of need at running back. We talk about it with the injuries and everything else, and obviously Pryor won't arrive at Ohio State till 2021, uh, but uh, they definitely need to replenish the depth at that position, and Pryor, a national top 100 guy, ranked as the number six running back in the 24-7 composite, 
and they may not be done at that position just yet. They may have one or two other guys who are uh, very much uh, looking at Ohio State as well. Uh, Andre Turrentine, a safety from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, ranked number 136 in the country. He picked the Buckeyes on uh, Tuesday. And then on Monday, it was Devontae Smith, a cornerback uh, from Cincinnati LaSalle on the 247 composite, ranked number 429. But again, uh, this is a guy that um, certainly uh, Kerry Combs, the defensive backs coach at Ohio State, uh, liked what he saw out of Devontae Smith, and uh, they made the offer, and, and uh, he committed. So four commitments in, in about two and a half to three days, and uh, really kind of uh, while the rest of the, the country or the rest of the world was kind of spinning its wheels with these new uh, restrictions and new provisions, Ohio State remotely, at least, was uh, able to close the deal on the four guys. And, uh, and uh, as we said, two of them national top 100 prospects. Yeah, Kevin, uh, your thoughts about the recruiting effort at this point? Yeah, we I went and looked at where Ohio State's 2021 class, based on their points in the Rivals.com team recruiting rankings, would fit against 2020 classes, and they would be 15th in the nation right now with one of those 15 teams or one of those 14 teams ahead of them being Ohio State's 2020 class. It also was better than all but two other, uh, not including Ohio State, recruiting classes from 2020 from the Big Ten. So they're, they're really in great shape. And, you know, one of the things to remember when we're talking about Evan Pryor, the, the uh, running back commitment out of Cornelius, uh, North Carolina, near Charlotte, is Ohio State certainly is taking two running backs in this class. So it creates an interesting conversation there. you got Trevion Henderson out of Virginia, and you've got Donovan Edwards out of the state of Michigan. Uh, Ohio State sitting in great shape with both of them. Ohio State's not going to get three. I mean, if all three want in, you know, they're going to say yes. But let's be realistic. That's not going to happen. And I think Ohio State is in really, really good shape with Trevion Henderson, another Rivals 100 caliber running back. And, you know, I think a lot of people out there are going to owe Tony Alford some apologies after everybody got really critical when B. John Robinson and Jalen Knighton both kind of fell apart at the end. You know, Ohio State now is, you know, really on the cusp of having two Rivals 100 backs in this class of 2021 and potentially somebody coming in the portal. I'm going to cut off Tony just real quick because I want to be able to filter through the comments and you guys hear me, uh, those of you that watch the live streams on a regular basis, um, try to explain the, the comments uh, portion of this and what I try to get to the screen. So I just, with three esteemed writers here, Todd, I so much appreciate you wishing uh, and hoping the family are safe and everybody else that's on the panel right here. The use of apostrophes, let's look into that. And again, with three esteemed writers, we want to get that we want to get that right. So check out the use of apostrophes. Uh, that's that's one of my, uh, actually one of my pet peeves is not using the term pet peeves, but but there it is in, in regards to the apostrophes. But recruiting, Tony, it's just they're out of their minds at this point. Yeah, to tack on to what Kevin was saying about the running backs, I really like Travion Henderson out of Virginia. I, I like him a bit better than Donovan Edwards. Who, it'll be interesting to see what happens if uh, Henderson commits to Ohio State and then Edwards, a Michigan, Bloomfield, Michigan, I believe, kid, does he leave the state? And what kind of damage would that do to Michigan's recruiting and, and to just the um, the image of Michigan recruiting if, they, if Ohio State says no to the top running back in Michigan and, and then Michigan can't get him either? That wouldn't be a great thing for Jim Harbaugh and the Wolverines. But it's been interesting to see the way they're attacking the secondary with Ohio State's defense being so versatile. They want you know outside corners, inside corners, deep safeties, and bullets. And with these three commitments last week, I think Ja'Kalen Johnson is one of those guys who's a, a pure outside corner. Uh, Devontae Smith looks like he can be one of those slot corners he – he also had so he had some other big time offers. He's a three star kid, but I assume he's going to rise up the rankings because you got Ohio State and you got Alabama after you. You're you're pretty good. And then the turn team kid uh, could be safety, could be corner. As Kerry Combs says, we'll put them all at corner, outside corner when they get here, and we'll see where they go from there. But they're just they're loading up in the secondary, which is good because they've uh, they're going to be a little bit thin this year and, and the year after, and so they need to restock. Yeah. Yeah, so so the uh, 
the the secondary hall yes has is uh, really been tremendous uh, the running back situation uh, obviously can't help what we're looking at in 2020 we can get back to recruiting but i also wanted to serve up the name that would help for 2020 possibly depending on the transfer Oklahoma's Trey Sermon. I've not called up his stats, but from watching the games and knowing his name and knowing that he's been a main contributor uh, there at Oklahoma, as soon as he entered the transfer portal, just because of his elite level play or near elite level play, I don't want to give him too much cred there, but he's a very, very good player. And then looking at Ohio State's need there, and again, need relative to expectations. There's there's not a need in regards to w- will they have serviceable, very beyond that good players at the position of running back? Yes, even without Trey Sermon. But when a guy like this becomes available and Ohio State's wanting to get back to the playoffs, uh, that's a noticeable name out there. Yeah, he's a, you know, he is a very solid back. Uh, he's not going to be the guy that's going to run away from you. He's not a 4-4 guy. He's more of a power back. Uh, he's coming off of his own knee injury. He got hurt during the Iowa State game after, uh, you know, very early in that game. Uh, his best season was 2018, where he rushed for near about 1,000 yards, 13 touchdowns in that season. Uh, you know, I he certainly is going to be a guy, if he ends up at Ohio State, that will be right there, right off the mix, you know, probably a 15 carry type of back. Uh, you know, you're going to have Marcus Crowley and, and you know, hopefully Master Teague all coming off of their injuries, too. So, you know, Ohio State's going to have a, a lot of potential. But, you know, I think the trainers are going to be extremely busy once they're allowed to get back and do their work. And and we return to some level of norm, normalcy at this point. Um, you know, there's a, some debate whether or not Sermon is going to need to take that visit to Ohio State before he makes a decision or if something could come could come sooner. I, I, I'm I'm of the mindset that something could come sooner. I, I'm not saying that we're going to see something happening in the next day or two, but I don't think we're going to see this drag out too long. Trey Sermon, yeah, I would say- fans. Sure, Steve. I just wanted to <clears throat> set you up here real quick uh, because Buckeye fans might remember that Trey Sermon caught a touchdown in Columbus in the uh, game that the Sooners won. Baker Mayfield, et cetera, three catches, 23 yards in that game, ran for 62 on 17 carries, Steve. Yeah, he's familiar with the end zone at Ohio Stadium and familiar with winning at Ohio Stadium. So that's uh, those are good things. If he never loses a game at Ohio Stadium as uh, as a college player and he plays at least a year at Ohio State, then I think everybody will be pretty happy about that. But uh, he is a guy, I think uh, he's rushed for about 2,000 yards in his career at Oklahoma, really came in and did some big things as a freshman, kind of got passed by, I think, this past year and then had the injury situation late in the year. And uh, I just think that he looks at the guys who uh, have been in front of him there at Oklahoma and has decided that uh, maybe the grass is greener somewhere else and will get more of an opportunity. And I think the situation in Ohio State is wide open. You're talking about Master Teague with uh, whatever it is, the Achilles. And he may not be back full go till October potentially, Um, you know, maybe back able to train in September and then uh, play in October, potentially something like that. Uh, Steel Chambers, Marcus Crowley dealing with his own injury. So it's very uh, much uh, 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 injury shortened group. You can always put Demario McCall back there. You'll have Mayan Williams arriving as a freshman in the fall, but it's hard for a freshman to make a tremendous impact uh, right away. Although J.K. Dobbins certainly did. Uh, so it's interesting. I think uh, Thurman, it brings uh, probably an understanding of what the expectation is to play at a high level, to play in a major conference, the demands of playing the running back position and everything else. If his knee checks out, and, and typically the ACL is not not always a full year. I mean, he could be back in seven or eight year, or months perhaps, and uh, maybe he'll be back ready to go uh, time for the start of the season camp. So I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. You know, I I wonder with players now being banished from the facilities and getting home remedies on how to rehab, like can you even – if things were normal, we could maybe expect Master Teague to be ready by the end of camp. Now I, I think do you, how, how, how long are things pushed back in terms of rehab? Like does – is the rehab situation for Master Teague pushed back an extra month because he's not getting full-time rehab from 
Adam Stewart and the guys at Ohio State, and we know how good they are at getting guys ready. That's not happening now. So in, maybe the timelines on all of the injury, injured guys need to be pushed back a little. I think Marcus Crowley should be fine because of when he was injured. But you look at the running back room, and Teague has an injury. Marcus Crowley has been injured. Trey Sermon has a history of in injuries. I think even back maybe in high school had some issues. Uh, so I guess, you know, you bring as many guys as you can and, and you hope two or three of them stay healthy for the season. But, um, you know, I'm Trey Sermon, I think over 2,000 yards rushing in, in his career, so you wouldn't turn that down. I don't think he comes in and, and is automatically the Ohio State starter. I think um, – I don't know who that is. Uh, we didn't get to see much of anything this spring. You know, all we would have seen this spring is that Steel Chambers is pretty good and we won't really know anything until the fall – when and what will we know then if, if Master Teague isn't good to go? I think we all here really like M Marcus Crowley based on what we've seen. Trey Sermon uh, has been a complimentary back his entire career. Can he become more? It's it'd be another storyline to follow, and we, we, you know we can always use those during the during camp. My guess is they've got some kind of plan in place. They have their mm -hmm. own sports medicine clinic now, kind of a standalone area. And my guess is people are still being seen on an outpatient basis as needed. I can't imagine that uh, they've, uh, you know, pulled the plug on medical uh, treatment for these people, even though, you know, campus is by and large closed. I mean, the hospital is still open. So either at that sports medicine clinic or uh, another uh, facility, I'm sure that they're still getting whatever the normal uh, rehab would be. If yeah, they're Gene, here, Gene if Smith. They're here because a lot, I mean, some of the out of state guys may have gone home at this point. Yeah. If you're a, if a, a year one or year, year two person where the expectation is that you have to live in campus housing and they've closed all of that and you sit there and Steel Chambers is from Georgia, Marcus Crowley's from Florida. So, I mean, it, it would be great. And I mean, I'm sure that there are going to be certain situations where. Guys have moved in with other guys to be able to make certain things work out or whatnot. But I, you know, not everybody's going to be in a situation to where they're going to be able to go down to Ackerman and go to that facility. Yeah. And Gene Smith mentioned that there would be um, protocols and things of that nature. He didn't go into what they would be, but it, it won't be ideal. And so maybe we need to just keep that in mind as. Uh, camp if, if camp finally gets underway and i also would expect probably more injuries this year this season in college football overall and maybe in sports overall with um just the lack of being able to do all of the necessarily necessary prescribed exercises and just staying in peak shape i i do wonder if like uh when ohio state signs players if they don't enroll early, they want them sending in videotapes of their workouts. I wonder if that is just the the norm right now for all of the players to send in, you know, this is what we want you to do. Send us some proof that you're doing it. And maybe in that way, they can hit the ground, at least jogging, maybe not running in, in late, late summer, but hit the ground jogging. I had somebody think, ask me last. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I think based on the timing of this, if, if they get an all clear, I mean, it's March 20th. If they get an all clear on like May 20th, um, it wouldn't surprise me if the NCAA allows uh, colleges to have, say, 10 practice sessions in June and uh, they're able to do installation at that time because that's what spring is all about is installation and that type of stuff. And, and I, I would think that there'd be some kind of a dispensation from the NCAA because – uh, college coaches are going to squawk to the NCAA that no way we can get this together in the preseason, you know, the way that, that it should be. So uh, my guess is we'll see some kind of truncated spring if, and again, make big if, we get it all clear within the next two months, maybe they can squeeze in a few practices in June and, and that'll be how it goes. Or even maybe uh, also opening fall camp a little early too. I don't know if you want to put yeah. – 15 practices or 13 practices on the front end of, of, of fall camp or whatnot. But with that being said, there is going to be the necessity to be able to, to knock off the ring rust and get these guys right. Or we are going to be dealing with a lot of knees and ankles and shoulders and whatnot. And, you know, that's going to just create its own set of issues. 
what if we can get a like a preseason scrimmage against uh, another team? You know, the basketball does that. They do their closed scrimmages. Ohio State has done that with Louisville. Maybe this being – this is a year where there's special dispensations for everything. Maybe if you have an elongated fall camp, you don't want to just beat up on each other for, you know, eight weeks, seven weeks, six weeks. Maybe bring in um, Georgia. <laughs> right, because they're the most superstitious lots on the a lot on the face of the earth. I don't know if they'd want to do anything to where there potentially could be any tape or anything yeah. about their yeah. team. Premature. They don't even let the media. I mean, in. No yeah, they don't let the media in. There's no way they're going to let the enemy, the other enemy, in. No. Well, and you have the risk of injury too with football. I don't think it's quite as bad in basketball. Um, I mean, you're at the mercy of the opponent. There's kind of a tacit agreement that I'm not going to injure you if you don't injure me type thing. And, um, you know, you don't want uh, to kind of put yourself at that uh, liberty, I suppose. So I don't know um, if uh, if playing a, another major college in the preseason is going to work. I mean, heck, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, we're, we're in an interesting time. I think there's going to be some – some interesting things that come out of this that that will lead to changes. I, it's hard to say what it'll be, but I think um, we're going to look back on this and say, oh, yeah, before the pandemic, it was done this way, and now it's done that way. And uh, there's going to be some, some interesting things that come out of it, maybe some better practices that will come out of this. We had a call-in show last night, and somebody asked me, hey, without spring football, how in the world are these teams going to be able to prepare for a football season in September? And my thought was, well, first of all, they're all in the same boat, so nobody has an inherent advantage. Now, of course, there are advantages for certain teams and certain programs because of the coaching stability and the coaching staff versus a first-year head coach at like a Florida State with Mike Norvell. Well, it's going to be more difficult for him having not um, – you know, built those relationships with the players and the coaching, the um, assistants, not building the relationship, the terminology, the whole deal, the culture and the structure of the deal. But that that goes with uh, the territory. But in regards to advantages, disadvantages, everybody is in the same boat. And I went back to and, and you guys have all heard from this gentleman many more times than I have. But I, I went back to uh, three different um, times I was able to hear from Jim Delaney at a luncheon. And he talked about, and, and as you guys know, he was always fighting the monster and trying to create uh, some kind of balance between big time athletics and letting these kids be students and trying to find that balance and trying to fight the uphill battle of uh, stemming the curve of just this being a full-time job all year, which has basically become, except for a few respites, it's a full-time job for these kids. And he was hearkening back to when he was a varsity athlete at the University of North Carolina. So we're talking North Carolina basketball. We're talking big time, going to a Final Four while he was there, just talking about the differences in what's expected of these athletes versus what was expected of him and the athletes of that day. And maybe we would just find a little bit more balance for this particular football season in regards to what is expected of these kids and how much time they devote to it. And everyone, again, would be in the same boat if there's a reasonable time at which they're able to get back to it here in the next couple months. Something I wanted to kind of throw out that, you know, similar but dovetailing a little bit as well is without having the spring practice period, let's remember Ohio State's over 85 scholarships mm -hmm. once the once the mid or once the regular summer enrollees get here. And normally spring would be an opportunity to be able to go through and sit there and have the conversations after spring and say, look, John Doe, we love you, but you're probably not going to have much of an opportunity here. So, you know, if they don't end up having that period, they're going to have to make some some decisions. I mean, they do have a potential gray shirt candidate and Jake Seibert uh, on, in the special teams. But, you know, if, if you lo and behold, bring in Trey Sermon, you lo and behold, decide that maybe you bring in a grad transfer corner because you're concerned about depth or whatever. The, you're, these are going to create positions of where you're going to have to be able to go through roster management and shed players before the start of fall camp when you have to be at that 85. Yeah, there's nothing worse than being cut via Skype. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh boy. I, I'm, I'm guessing there are a lot of people that can relate to that across the country, unfortunately, right now, uh, in terms of their employment. I've kept this, uh, post on the screen for a while here and I want to get to it because then I've tried to substantiate it here with a recruiting list right now. So Yakov 22, it appears that the top players in Michigan are all doing what they can to avoid going to the university of Michigan. So according to the two, four, seven composite for 2021, the number one player in the state, JT Tui Molo Ow, is split between Ohio state and Washington and some other teams. As you had to commit. Corey Foreman's number two. He's committed to Clemson. Jack Sawyer, familiar with him? Ohio State. Leonard Taylor. Uh, the two top candidates right now appear to be Florida and Miami. James Williams, Georgia. Caleb Williams, Oklahoma, LSU. Tommy Brockemeyer, Texas, Alabama. Donovan Jackson, we're familiar with him. Uh, Ohio State. I need to go down the list to player number 21 in the state. JJ, before I yeah. find a Michigan commit to the University of Michigan or okay. anybody that's leaning toward Michigan. That's, that's not, that's not that, those, that's not, those aren't uh, state of Michigan players. Uh, you mentioned a lot. Of oh, and that's it, what I thought I got to. No, I'm Jack sorry. Sawyer's out of Pickerington. Donovan Jackson's out of Houston. That was the national list. Yeah, like Damon Payne. <laughs> that is the national list. Rivals, oh. Damon Payne is your number I one. I I corrected player. that. In a, a defensive tackle out of Belleville. Strike everything I just said, everybody out there. I, I thought I corrected that. Record. That's what I was guarding against, but I didn't. And then I should have known when I saw these Miamis and Floridas popping up. Okay, well, we'll try to get on that. But that's a difficult list to find. But I'll, I'll do my best to try to verify what he's talking about because I um, – wanted to get at that but we'll, well, we'll let you guys take off mark on. i can tell you right now yep just based on the the composite michigan has one in-state commit in the 2021 class and he's the number four player in state uh now they are battling for other guys but yeah i mean they only have two players committed right now in the 2021 class and the last commitment came in may and i believe that was um that was either the the michigan in-state kid they have or the quarterback jj mccarthy who's a five-star kid five-star recruit but it's been a while since they have gotten anybody uh they've gotten 2020 you know some 2020 kids i assume more recently than the, than the 2021 class so they need to and i've been writing about it this week just the disparity between ohio state recruiting and michigan recruiting and it is vast and it is getting um vaster or more vast whichever english you prefer uh like there's Ohio State's current roster has 33 top 100 players. Michigan's current roster has five. And this is based on the, the composite of all of the rankings. Uh, so it's, it is getting wider and wider. And the, um, <laughs> like Ohio State, they're one of their lowest, their second lowest ranked receiver is Chris Olave right now, which should tell you that their recruiting is ridiculous and next year they've already got two top 100 two top 100 kids and trying to get another out of washington so uh, jim harbaugh is in trouble and <laughs> has been in trouble and the thing is it's just not it's not getting any better and recruiting continues to keep up the same steam ahead at ohio state and it's definitely losing steam at michigan as the wolverines you know they have some guys at the top but the bottom, I mean, they've got as many position guys on their roster ranked outside of the top 1,000 as they do ranked inside the top 100. Folks, I will try to attempt to set the record straight. All right. Uh, the top four players in the state of Michigan, as high school players in the state of Michigan, are all undecided. But Ohio State is, is in play for several of them. Notre Dame as well. Michigan as well. Uh, I'm going by the 247 composite. The number five player in the state has committed to Michigan. Then you've got to go. I don't see another player committed to Michigan, and I don't see Michigan in the running for many of these kids, and I'm down into the 30s, and they shouldn't really want to have too many of those mm -hmm. uh, down in that range. So we've got one player committed to Michigan in the top like 40 players in the state. Again, it's very early, but they're not even in the running, apparently, for many of them. What happens if Damon Payne goes to Ohio State, Rocco Spindler goes to Notre Dame, and Donovan Edwards goes to UGA? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's the the the, the, the drum beats are going to get just that much louder around uh, Jim Harbaugh and whatnot, and he'll be able to still show that he can put together, you know, a, a top twenty type class. He'll go back to recruiting Florida and some other states. But you know, if you can't if you can't do anything in your own state at this point, and honestly, with a first year head coach at Michigan State, they really should be doing better in state. And I and I get it that. You know, other programs sit there and they they sense weakness in the state and they go in and they're going to try and poach these types of players. But this isn't, you know, this isn't a one-year occurrence. Uh, Ohio State, Notre Dame, other programs have been able to go in there. And then Ohio State comes back and brings Kerry Combs back. I mean, he's planting flags all over the place up there. So, you know, I, it's not going to end well for the Maize and Blue. Michigan did not sign. Oh my goodness. Let's make sure I'm getting the okay. Let's 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 move on because it did it, it threw me to like can we clean up the site a little bit, uh Steve? Wait, we've got some issues with the site, man. I'm I'm on Michigan high school recruits. I want to just go to the next year. I get pushed to the national scene again. Well, we'll we'll get back Here's on that. Rivals. I know. I know that <laughs> get, that's, get, that's get together with I your agree. IP folks. I agree. That's a glitch. No, that's that's fine. So yes, uh, hopefully everyone's stocked up on uh, toilet paper. Hopefully we've we've um, weathered that storm to date. Da, da, da. All right, 2020 top football recruits in Michigan. All right. The number one player in the state signed with Kentucky. The number two player in the state signed with Michigan. Then we've got a Purdue signee and a Penn State signee. Michigan got number five. Michigan got two of the top five. They got three of the top eight. And then nothing until number 22. So I I signed Mr. Football from there. And I know that, you know, that doesn't always equate to being number one in the rankings, but Ohio State goes in and gets Cameron Martinez, uh, a player that really didn't sniff Michigan all that, you know, all that long in the situation, but you go to the top and you look at Justin Rogers and, you know, Ohio state was around there for a while on him, UGA, but I mean, he rode with Kentucky all there, all there, but you look at some of the guys that got away Malik Carr getting to Purdue. And I think that one's going to come around and bite them in the rear end. I think he's a tremendous player. Uh, Enzo Jennings, the safety is going to uh, Penn state. I think he's going to be pretty good as well. Um, and you look at one of the other guys that got in the top 10 with Macari page, and again, I'm using the rivals rankings. He was somebody that if Ohio State compliance didn't kind of screw up their interpretation of, of rules, probably would have been at Ohio State. Yeah, you've uh, covered that ground with us in the past. Uh, definitely, yeah, that's that situation. It is concerning, though, when there's maybe seven, six, seven guys that you would think each year in state that, would be good enough to play at Michigan on an annual basis. And they should, they can't lock the state down. And when that is your base and knowing that there's only so many guys there, you need to be able to keep those guys in state. And, and, and they're just not an Ohio state had what Grant Tutant, the offensive tackle, the three-star guy that they got out of Michigan in 2020 as well. And then Cameron Martinez, Nine minutes of touchdown highlights, and you don't even get near him. You don't even so, scratch the surface. <laughs> so there's – I don't know if it's lack of effort, but I've said this a number of times. When you watch that Amazon Prime show from when they when they were with, embedded with Michigan, it, it is a, a sad uh, – and like it, it would almost be like they, they were the pre-quarantine quarantine, and there's just nothing going on there. It's um, they were just preparing. They're ahead of the curve, Tony. Yeah. Yes. They. They. <laughs> yes. They were definitely. They were preppers. Uh, what they were prepping for, um, not so much. But just a very lack of excitement, lack of enthusiasm, uh, blase. Just, just a weird vibe there. Just watching that entire show, and you can understand why that wouldn't allure recruits there. And as we know, I, each of us have had some interactions with Jim Harbaugh. He's a bit of an odd duck. <laughs> interesting. Uh, yes, interesting. And sometimes you can interact with him. Other times you, you, you can't. Um, never had that issue with Ryan Day. 
Uh, Urban Meyer, mm, uh, but he's just he's he's a different guy, and I, I don't think it's helping recruiting at all. That difference. I just want to throw one more thing in there. Last year, according to the rivals' rankings, that Michigan signed the top player from in-state, 2017, with DPJ. Hmm. So I, I got to say, in watching Jim Harbaugh after these Ohio State losses and the last one in particular, and being just peppered with these questions and the obvious questions, what is it? Is it lack of preparation, intensity, execution? Is it a talent gap? You know, he can't really go to any one thing because it's going to make him or the program or the players look bad. And I see where he's just at a loss for words because he's got to know he's a football guy. He's played the sport his whole life and coached it. He knows what it is, what the combination is or what is primarily the issue. Uh, but it all points back to him or he throws the players under the bus. So he just, you know, typically points to, yeah, well, we just didn't get things done. <laughs> well, and Quite apparent. the, the, I told you there were um, five top 100 guys on Michigan's roster. There are 15 on Penn state's. So Penn state is coming in and can, they are now distancing themselves from Michigan. They've won two of the last three. And if Michigan can't compete with Penn state, how are they going to compete with Ohio state? And it, it's the, I don't think somebody could come in and, and do take over Michigan and do worse in recruiting because there would be a new energy and or energy, you know, just and Mark, you're talking about those press conferences. Each one he he's he used to get mad. Now it's just you know, it's, it's just part of the annual exercise of November. It's like, yeah, we, we got beat. Um, you know, well, what is it? Is it this? Is it this? It's all of them. But how do you, you know, like Mark said, Mark, how do you say that? Yeah. And yet, despite the Michigan bashing here, we've got Pinero five, Piro saluting myself, go blue, Michigan. Pinero, we appreciate uh, you stopping by each and every time for the Buckeyes live stream and all Michigan fans are welcome. All right. There's an interesting conversation going on. And uh, again, man, another, um, term that I hate to use because it's overused. Interesting, but I just did. Anyway, uh, there is a conversation in the live chat concerning Urban Meyer and his legacy versus Ryan Day. Who's done better? Who's performed better? What's it say about Urban Meyer? I would have loved to have taken some kind of exhaustive poll of Ohio State fans uh, right after the Rose Bowl win over Washington about Urban Meyer's performance at Ohio State. And then the barometer of what it is now. It's obviously in the eyes of the fan base being diminished about what Ryan Day's accomplished on the recruiting path. And of course, in going undefeated and in some people's eyes being ripped off of a national championship game appearance. I think he's going to do just fine. Um, I don't, I mean, the day was going to come eventually where Urban Meyer was going to leave, whether it was last year, next year, five years from now, somebody had to follow him. And I think that it's hard to imagine a better transition from one coach to the next. And this coach is already stacking one top five class on top of another, just like his predecessor did. And there's no reason to think that they're not going to win at the same level. Are they going to win a national championship? I can't promise you that because we know that that is something that is just so far out there and you got to get breaks and be great on top of everything else to, to win the national championship. But um, man, I, I don't know how it could have gone any smoother. And uh, I would say at this point, it's looking like about a nine or, or a 10 on a scale of one to 10, but that that's just me being, you know, here, I guess. I don't know what, what other people may think about it. Yeah, do we feel like uh, Urban Meyer's uh, shine has been tarnished by Ryan Day's success, or is it too early? Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, you son of a gun. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think that uh, you have a lot of built-in advantages coaching at Ohio State uh, just based on being the flagship school in a talent-producing state, uh, strong uh, – administration support in terms of facilities and whatnot. I, I don't think that you're going to sit there and say, well, because Ryan is doing it, 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 it cheapens anything that Urban was doing. I think that uh, Ryan has been able to benefit off of a lot of 
a lot of things that Urban put into place. He's certainly benefiting having the office staff that he does with uh, the the Volts and the Pantones and the Maratis of the world. So you know, there, I, th I think that it doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to be a competition between the two. We want to always sit there and rank things and compare things or whatnot. But this isn't necessarily something I think that needs to be compared. And in, in, I mean, I think Ohio State fans should be able to enjoy both of them. And Ohio State detractors, well, tough luck. Kevin, we are in an era right now we have no sports. So we will rank anything we want. We will you're, compare oh, anything oh, we want. Where's here? You're last. I don't like you. <laughs> but – with the, the Urban Meyer, I saw White Knight mention that Urban Meyer is a product of being in the right place in the right time. and Four times, uh, I guess. Yeah. The luckiest man on the face of the earth. Congrats to him. Uh, he should go uh, play the lottery, and he could become a rich man. But uh, this is a guy who took over Ohio State, and there was some talent, um, six and seven Ohio State, and, and immediately 12-0 and 0 that next season and, and created just as – like each successive coach over the last few years, save for the the one year of Luke Fickle, has taken Ohio State into the next uh, level of football, into modern football. Earl Bruce from Woody Hayes, then John Cooper from Earl Bruce, then Jim Tressel from John Cooper, and, and and then Urban Meyer. And Ryan Day has even gone, taken it, taken it. I don't know further, but just modernized it. There's less um, stress on the the quarterback running and, and things of that nature, but. Urban Meyer created this Lamborghini that Ohio State is now, and, and Ryan Day is able to drive it. He may be a really, really good driver, um, and we'll see. And then, you know, the whole you're born on third base and you think you hit a triple. Ryan Day was maybe born on third base, but he he was he watched how Urban Meyer put him there, and then he, he's going to want to do continue to do the same thing. I mean, he's been watching from – learning from Urban Meyer and then implementing his own stuff, and – Right now, things are working, and they don't appear as – as Kevin said, there's a lot of built-in advantages here. You should win here. Uh, if you lose here, you, you, you're you not a very good coach. If you win here, you, you might, you're just an average coach. If you really win here, then, then, then we can start judging how good you are. But you shouldn't lose at Ohio State, and you should win, you know, 10 games a year right now based on the, what, the, tra the trajectory of things, which Ryan Day has continued to, continue to um, keep going. I want to keep it on Urban Meyer for just a second, but I do think that Yakov 22 has a great um, statistic, and I believe it's accurate hmm. uh, because I've heard similar statistics. So I, I think this is right on where we can obviously gauge the, the talent at any one program based on the recruiting rankings on one end of the career and then on the other end of the career, the draft selections into the NFL. Michigan, without a first-round skilled offensive player taken in the NFL draft, since Braylon Edwards in 2005, and I'm almost positive that is correct. Uh, thank you, Akov22, because I've, I've heard the same statistic and I wouldn't have been able to go to the exact year, but Braylon Edwards, the Browns in 05. Uh, Todd B. simply stating, and a Clemson fan as well, Clemson alum stated, uh, Urban Meyer, one of the greatest coaches of all time. I wish uh, if somebody in the um, live chat can give me this source, there is a source, and I'm talking about a top-level site that rated Urban Meyer like the, mm -hmm. the 42nd greatest coach of all time or the 48th, and I was like, I thought that was insane. I wouldn't even rank him in the lower portion of the top 10. It wasn't at ESPN? It was. I'm looking oh. at the link right now. <laughs> <laughs> Should we like talk about this? Help, and they've got it right on campus to get those rankings right. My goodness, he's got the best winning percentage of all time post World War II. You got to go to the the old Notre Dame dudes, Leahy and Rockney, to trump him in regards to winning percentage. And again, at four stops, if uh, you know, like Dabo Sweeney's doing a fantastic job at Clemson, and if he wins another couple of national championships, whatever he accomplishes that's near what he's been doing will be fabulous. Except for I, I would continue to make some distinction between the coach who did it at one place versus the guy that just goes wherever doom, and just turns it around, turns it around, turns it around, turns it around. And that's, of course, Urban Meyer. And I can't think of anybody else who's done it to that magnitude at multiple places. Well, how okay, Saban has X number of national championships, five or six, whatever the number is. Meyer had three. How far back 
do we have to go to find a coach that had three? I think Joe Paterno only had two. Woody Hayes only had two that mattered. I know that there were a splinter, you know, 61 and 70, but they don't really count. I'm talking about actual most recognized in that season national championships. He had three. How far do you have to go back? Barry Switzer? I don't even know. Who 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 would be Tom Osborne? Tom Osborne. He, yeah, he had three. three. So now we've mentioned one other coach in the last 40 years, in addition to Saban, that did what he did. I did I miss a meeting? I, I don't know. I, I'm confused how how you would discount the number of national championships the guy had in his career. I mean, I mean, there were years back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s where maybe four different teams could claim a national championship in a given year. But I think rational thinking people can look at the data and say, no, Alabama was the best team that year. You know, and I think in a lot of cases people have kind of sorted through it. I mean, Bear Bryant won, you know, however many he had. So, you know, I the whole thing is a patently absurd. Is what I'm also is. a bigger proponent of the winning percentage because national championships have been voted on. Hmm. Then we had two teams that were randomly selected to a certain extent to go to a BCS championship game. Now we got this playoff selection committee where we could argue that so-and-so was left out. But when you just talk about going on the field and winning the games and doing it uh, in the SEC and the Big Ten at the last two spots, <laughs> just the flat out, you're, you're winning the games. There's no evaluation that needs to be made of that. Uh, yeah, we could dive into schedules, but again, you're doing it in the SEC and the Big Ten. I don't think we need to do a, a you know grind through the the schedule year to year uh, to win at that rate. I just think it's just phenomenal. Well, in this article, let's not forget that Urban Meyer is 46th and Lloyd Carr is 50th. So you know, it's just, and I'm I'm going through the list and of the 45 coaches ahead of him. I, I, I consider myself a pretty good student of the game. I haven't heard of like 10 of these coaches who are all division three or whatnot, or were coaching three toes McGee back in the, in the office or whatnot. It's, 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 it's a horse crap list. But it was, but it was done by a blue ribbon panel. So. Right. Blue ribbons. They're the best. <laughs> All right. I guess I better move on from that. But uh, I got myself into trouble there. I I just when I heard that, I just uh, like I expected to hear. Oh, did you hear where Urban Meyer was ranked? It's awful. I thought it's oh, seventh. It's be like, se yeah, I thought it was going to be like seventh. Uh, and I was going to be like, yeah, yeah, he should be higher than that. He should be third or fourth. <laughs> it, it just it shows you the I don't know, the pettiness of a, a lot of the voters to I mean. Because that's that's it. That's the average. Some had him lower than that, you know. Yeah. Some would sure. have him in the top ten. Some would have him down to eighty. Like, how how petty are you that you know that you vote <laughs> Lloyd Carr ahead of Urban Meyer? Because you know mathematically it, it would seem that some some would have, but you know I, because well, he didn't answer your question or he didn't like you. I mean, that's that's part of being the media. Well, Ralph Russo of the AP got dragged on Twitter because he did his mm. current coaching list and he didn't have Ryan Day on it because he didn't put the criteria of, you know, coaches with one year of experience need not apply. And he's he's been absolutely destroyed over there and has had to go back and kind of defend his list multiple times. So, again, not a big list guy myself. I'm, I'm getting into, into lists. I'm more more of a list guy than I was a month ago. I've always been a big list guy, big list guy. You can sucker me into any top 10 and people have advised me that instead of these kind of discussions, I should do nothing but spew out lists, mm -hmm. top 10, this top five, this, and, and maybe, but I'd rather discuss with intelligent people. But the whole, right. the, the, can I get real quick? The Ralph Absolutely. Russo, I, I don't, Ryan day has like 1.3 years of experience. Like, that's, come on. You know, at what point, at, the whole it was a dumb rule in my opinion and it's, it's his rule it's, it's his, his right to do that but uh it, it's almost a way to protect yourself from making yourself look stupid on uh on twitter in a couple of years when you have ryan day ranked sixth and he gets fired within three years because he probably <laughs> did this uh a decade ago and had larry coker right you know as the number two two coach in the nation and then 
two years later, or maybe Gene Chizik, and he got burnt by that. So, you know, fool, fool him once, fool him twice, fool him three times. Now I'm going to start putting rules in. All right, folks. So we do this each and every week. We don't know what time because we got four people participating and we've got schedules all over the place. Maybe it'll be easier in the coming weeks, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. But anyway, it's Kevin Noon from Rivals. Please check him out on Buckeye Grove. We got Steve Hellwagon down in the corner from uh, Bucknuts 247 and below me, Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone. And we appreciate the Ohio State and college football expertise from these three. Guys, we appreciate it. Stay safe. And uh, hopefully we can get together next week. You too. Sounds good. We're talking Miami football next here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So keep it right here.